Well, anyway, this is all background. The, the most, you might almost say the most important event of Buchanan's administration, or the most important, took place at the very end and at the very beginning. The very end, which we'll get to, is the secession of southern states. But the very beginning is one of the most famous decisions of the Supreme Court in all its history. Of course, I'm talking about the Dred Scott decision. Here's Dred Scott and his wife, Harriet Scott. By the way, we should not forget about Harriet Scott because her fate was also decided by the Supreme Court even though we call it the Dred Scott decision. And by the way, they also had two daughters whose fate was also decided. So it was an entire family uh, where the Supreme Court had to decide whether they were slave or free. But anyway, it's the Dred Scott case as it, or as they call it in legal lingo, Dred Scott v. Sanford. Dred Scott against Sanford. In a minute, we'll f who is Sanford? Was Sanford the owner of Dred Scott? No, he wasn't. Who is this Sanford guy? Well, we'll figure it out. Dred Scott was the slave of Dr. John Emerson of Missouri. In the 1830s, Emerson took Scott with him to Illinois where slavery was prohibited by state law, and then into the, what was then the Wisconsin Territory, where slavery was prohibited by the Missouri Compromise. Remember, that was part of the old Louisiana Purchase, and the Missouri Compromise had prohibited slavery in the, that area north of the boundary of Missouri, and then brought him back to Missouri. So Scott, Scott's not a fugitive slave, remember, not a fugitive slave, and brought there voluntarily by his owner to two places where slavery is illegal, one under state law, one under a law of Congress, and then back to Missouri. Um, then uh, Dr. Emerson died, and according to his will, the slave passed, the ownership of Scott passed to his daughter, Henrietta, who was a minor, and therefore, uh, the executor of the will actually sort of managed the affairs of the estate, and that was John Sanford. So Sanford is the executor of, Dr. of the owner's will. That's why he gets sort of named in the, in the case. So in 1846, Dred Scott sued in Missouri court for his freedom on the grounds that residents uh, in a free area had made him free. I have referred to this principle previously, the so-called freedom principle, or the Somerset principle, or whatever you want to call it. The idea that once a slave is outside the jurisdiction where the law made him a slave, he sort of reverts to the natural right of, to freedom of mankind. Uh, especially if he goes into a place where slavery is, is barred by local law. And there were, you know, there were cases like this all over the place. There were cases in Missouri like this. There were cases in Illinois like this. Abraham Lincoln fought a case like this. He was on the wrong side. We'll talk about that when we get to Lincoln. He actually represented an owner who tried to get back a slave who he'd brought into Illinois. And the judge said, you know, nice try, Lincoln, but everyone knows that the guy's got to be free. I mean, we all know that. That's the principle of law now. But, um, and in fact, the precedents in Missouri were, you know, mostly in favor of Scott's claim. And in fact, the first court to deal with this, the local court, actually said, yeah, Dred Scott's free because he was brought into a free state. But then on appeal, the Missouri Supreme Court reversed that decision in 1852, in a, in a, and their ruling was, um, uh, let's say, frankly political. They said, you know, yeah, in the past, slaves have been able to get freedom in this way, but uh, nowadays there's all these annoying abolitionists out there, and uh, we don't want to give any aid to them whatsoever, so we're not recognizing that precedent anymore, and Dred Scott is, and his wife are still, um, and daughters, are still uh, slaves. Um, Meanwhile, to further complicate the matter, Mrs. Emerson, the widow of the owner, married a fellow named Reverend Chafee from Massachusetts, who was a know-nothing and Republican who was elected to Congress in the middle of the 1850s and was anti-slavery and uh, actually supported uh, bringing this suit to the Supreme Court. Um, 
uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, that many Republicans hoped that the Supreme Court would rule in favor of Dred Scott and that would bolster this uh, so-called freedom principle. Um, Scott brought the, so Scott is now sort of owned by someone in Massachusetts, uh, according to the law, um, and he sues Sanford on, uh, under the principle that citizens of two states, if there's an adjudi- a problem of, between citizens of two states, it can go to federal court. So the case goes up to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. It's argued at the end of 1856. Prominent law, this is a big case. I mean, people understood this is a big case. Prominent people were on both sides. Uh, Reverdy Johnson, a major political leader of Kentucky, represented Sanford, Montgomery Blair, a major member of the Blair family, major political family of this era, represented uh, Dred Scott. Now, the Supreme Court at this time, like the nation, was very divided. Basically, there were four Northerners, four Southerners, and the Chief Justice was from the the border, Maryland. The Chief Justice was uh, Roger Tawney, T-A-N-E-Y, Roger Tawney of Maryland. How did Tony get to be Chief Justice? It's a kind of odd experience, 30, 20 years earlier or so. Um, Tony had been working for the administration of Andrew Jackson. When Jackson, in the middle of the 1830s, destroyed, this is a little bit of a detour, but how did he get there? The, the uh, Jackson, as you know, if you've taken that period of American history, decided to destroy the Bank of the United States, the National Bank. And in doing so, he ordered his Secretary of the Treasury to remove the, dep- the United States, the, the, the money the, the government had was, in, was deposited in the Bank of the United States. Jackson said, I want to take all that money out, which will destroy that bank. And the Secretary of the Treasury, whose name I can't remember at the moment, refused, said, this is, this, this is a bad policy, I'm not going to do it. Jackson fired him and put... Tawney in as Secretary of the Treasury, whereupon Tawney did what Jackson ordered him to do. And then he was rewarded when John Marshall, the great Chief Justice, died. Jackson appointed Tawney Chief Justice of the Supreme Court as a kind of reward for his services in the bank war. Anyway, there were four Northerners from Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts. There were four Southerners from Georgia, Tennessee, Virginia, Alabama, and one Tawney in the middle. Now, Tawney um, was a a typical figure of that strange border area of Maryland. He had been a slave owner, but he'd actually emancipated his own slaves that he had uh, inherited. Um, And um, he, but he strongly believed in colonization, that is, that Um, any freed slave should be sent to Liberia in Africa. He he did not like the idea of any significant free black population uh, in the United States. So he was not a pro-slavery zealot, um, but he certainly was not an abolitionist or a Republican uh, either.